Uh, hello to everybody. Good afternoon. A pleasure to be with all of you. And uh, my topic for today I have chosen is uh, uh, basic insights into uh, different types of egg morphology and uh, wound modulation uh, following trabeculectomy. Right. So uh, we all know that uh, trabeculectomy uh, even today remains the gold, gold standard for uh, glaucoma surgery. And the basic goal of the surgery is to establish a stable surgical fistula. And one needs to ensure that there is constant flow through that fistula. Uh, but the problem that we encounter is there is a concept called indefinite bleb remodeling. So a bleb that may appear functional and good immediately post-op may not appear so over the course of years and months. Trap has a success rate of 80 to 95. Sita, ma'am, can you mute your mic, ma'am? Yeah, thanks, yeah. ma'am. So, uh, the tribe has a success rate of 80 to 95% at the end of a year, and it drops dramatically to 50 to 60% at the end of five years. This goes on to say that there is so much tissue remodeling, uh, assuming that you have done a, a neat job during the surgery. So there are factors which are not in our control and factors which are in our control. So we could only play around with factors which are in our control. Uh, the interesting part about TRAP in contrast to surgery elsewhere is here we don't want healing. We want to retard the process of healing by administering antifibrotic drugs, which is where the role of wound modulation comes into play. So I have divided, my class will not go for more than 15 minutes, after which we could have an interactive session, if you please, to do that. So initially, I'm just going to tell you the different morphological appearances of the bleb, uh, what we can do to do wound modulation, and different techniques available to uh, salvage a bleb that shows signs of imminent failure or it's, or it's starting to fail. So we all know that any healing process has three different stages. There is initial inflammation, fibrosis, collagen formation, and it finally accumulates in remodeling. So this is just a slide to tell us at what different stages we can implement wound modulation. I haven't included the preoperative uh, part of it. So basically, one needs to ensure a, a, a healthy ocular surface. And in patients who have been on long-term uh, anti-glaucoma drugs, there is an altered ocular surface milieu. Those who are on long-term topical carbonic anhydrase uh, inhibitors and brimonidine have chronic follicular conjunctivitis, inflamed conjunctiva, and all that can actually lead to the failure of the bleb. So in patients who have a very conspicuous ocular surface inflammation, we could withhold the topical anti-glaucoma drugs for a couple of weeks before the trial and replace it with maybe systemic acetazolamide. We could also uh, give topical steroids. There is no hard and fast rule. It all is uh, managed at the discretion of the surgeon. But these are some measures we could do preoperatively to ensure that we have a reasonable success rate with regards to our TRAB following surgery. Intraoperatively, a meticulous surgical technique. We need to ensure we do the procedure using non-tooth forceps. Grasping the conjunctiva with a tooth forceps is what we have always been used to. So we would want to use a non-tooth forceps to prevent those micro perforations that could occur otherwise. One needs to create a large scleral flap and not cut the flap all the way to the limbus, be it a triangular or a rectangular flap, doesn't matter. But our general tendency is to take the nick all the way to the limbus, but we stop short. We don't, we leave it uh, 0.5 to 1 millimeter short of the limbus. So when we do that, we actually facilitate a posterior flow of the aqueous <laughs> rather than an anterior bleb. A single a single scleral punch sclerostomy is recommended. We could, use, we could use adjustable or releasable sutures, and we need to ensure we treat a large area with antifibrotics, mitomycin or 5-FU, depending on your preference. Pharmacological adjuvants, steroids, preoperative, again at the discretion of the surgeon, antifibrotics. And now there is an interest in the role of anti-VEGF, Primarily in the management of neovascular glaucoma, for obvious reason, reasons, it could <coughs> sorry, reduce the incidence of intraoperative or postoperative hyphema, cause a regression or transient regression of the new vessels in the iris and angle. 
Then you have physical spaces, collagen and amniotic membrane, which again by uh, sheer virtue of their space, prevent an addition between the conjunctiva and the underlying episclera. Post-operatively, how the topical uh, steroid regimen would differ is we need to give steroids for a longer period of time compared to what we give for patients with cataract. So a longer steroid uh, uh, course, intense steroid course, and these patients apparently don't really develop a steroid-induced component of ocular hypertension because anyway, the aqueous humor is draining out through the ostium and not through the trabecular meshwork, which is where steroids actually play a role in inducing uh, hypertension. Um, okay, the mechanical uh, procedures for salvaging the bleb, I'll speak about later. I honestly have no idea what this radiation is about, so I'm going to skip that. So this is just a very basic comparison of 5-FU and MMC, but all that we need to understand is mitomycin C is more popular. It's just a single intraoperative uh, application, uh, more potent, <clears throat> it's more popular. And the problem with all these adjuvants is, although they reduce the incidence of um, bleb fibrosis, they come at the cost of increased uh, complications. Typically with mitomycin, thin cystic blebs prone for leaks, and uh, blebitis and endorf and so forth. So this is a uh, glaucoma surgeon's dream. This is what is called the ideal functional bleb. So all surgeons aspire to get to this bleb. And this is basically a typically low diffuse, low lying diffuse bleb extending posteriorly with a vascularity that is comparable to the rest of the conjunctiva. Theoretically, we do speak about microsis, but personally, I have never been able to appreciate microsis on the slit lamp. Apparently, they are better picked up on imaging like UBM and ASOCT. Now, that was an ideal bleb, but again, we do not live in an ideal world. So more often than not, we are faced with blebs that really don't pleasure us much. So blebs that don't look very appealing can be morphologically described or they can be determined by the time duration of the air presentation. So imagine post-operatively, less than around two weeks post-op, you see a flat, angry looking vascular bleb, pressures are raised and ostium is patent. So here it's basically early post-op inflammatory component. You could just amp up the steroids when you see a very vascular en engorged conjunctiva. Later on, three to six months later, you could get a fibrous thick wall where, uh, bleb with minimum vascularity. But here again, the bleb is not functional. Immediately, about up to a month after surgery, if you see a flat inflamed conjunctiva in the place of a bleb, you would have to think of these four possible options. It could be a tight flap sutures, it could be a blocked ostium, just exuberant inflammation or a bleb leak. And all of this has to be aggressively managed in order to ensure that you have a long-term functional bleb. And later on, the reasons are simply uh, episcleral uh, fibrosis. So these are the causes uh, where we know that we do not have the ideal bleb that we have aimed for. This is a very general non-specific classification, but we have several different classifications which have been there in the literature, but I'm not sure people actually use it for practical purposes. You have the Indiana bleb scoring system, Moorfield's bleb grading system, then you have Kronfeld, then you have imaging, which is now taking interest as far as classifying bleb based on their morphology is concerned. So this is just an example of Moorfields where you have standardized slit lamp photographs and you compare your patient's bleb to the standard criteria here and you give them a score based on how, what area the bleb occupies, the height of the bleb and the vascularity of the bleb. And each image has a point. So you compare which Bleb, your bleb looks closest to which image and you assign a score. <clears throat> Similarly, for Indiana bleb system, again, based on the extent, the clock hours, the vascularity and Seidel's test. But for practical purposes, I, it doesn't seem very practical and plausible to use this. But yes, this is a, a very objective way of assessing your bleb morphology and knowing where you stand as far as, far as functionality of your bleb is concerned. UBM has now taken a, a, a lead as far as uh, classifying bleb morphology is concerned. And this was first proposed by Yamamoto. And uh, he spoke about a, uh, an ideal bleb as having low reflectivity. A good bleb would have intra-bleb cysts, 
and you would actually be able to appreciate the drainage tract under the scleral flap. You could identify the sclerostomy site and a patent pyridectomy. So this is basically the clinical picture and the comparable UBM picture. So this is a good bleb. So on UBM, what you would see is a bleb that has low reflectivity, um, microcyst, a good subscleral tract, and a moderate height. In contrast to a scarred or fibrous bleb, if you were to compare the image D1 as against A1, here you see a bleb that has high reflectivity. It is relatively low in height, and you don't really see the subscleral tract that you visualize in the functional bleb. So yes, it would give you a, a better uh, dimension as far as objectively assessing bleb mor morphology. So how do you, what do you do when you're faced with a bleb that doesn't look like an ideal bleb in, in your outpatient clinic? If it is feasible to do gonioscopy, as in it's not the immediate post-op period, and you have ensured that the ostium is not blocked, the ostium could be blocked internally either by iris, fibrin, blood, or vitreous. If it's iris or um, uh, fibrin or blood, it undergoes spontaneous dissolution. But otherwise, iris or uh, vitreous blocking the ostium would need intervention perhaps with an NDAG. If you have ensured that the internal ostium is patent, then your next first step would be a massage. A massage can be done as early as a first or a second post-op visit when you don't see the ideal bleb that you have hoped to see. There are specific ways of ensuring you do a safe massage. And at the end of the massage, you should be able to see an elevation in the height of the bleb and a moderate reduction in the intraocular pressure, at the same time ensuring that you have not brought about a collapse in the depth of the anterior chamber. Trapped patients need more frequent follow-ups, longer follow-ups compared to patients who have undergone a cataract surgery. It is advised, I'm sorry, you review these patients once a week and every time you see the patient, you need to focus on the morphology of the bleb, bleb in addition to measuring the pressures and assessing the depth of the anterior chamber. So once a massage could be tried a couple of times, you could even instruct a compliant patient to do the massage. You could teach the patient to do the massage themselves. But after a couple of visits, if you have figured that every visit you need a massage to ensure that there is a bleb formation, then you would perhaps need to be a little more aggressive and do a different salvaging techniques where you manipulate the suture. You could do a laser suture lysis or if you have intraoperatively applied in a releasable suture, you could remove the suture at the slit lamp. Now the timing of the suture removal, suture manipulation is critical. If you have not used antimetabolites, you could do it within 10 days. But if you have used antimetabolites, it's advisable to uh, manipulate with the sutures at least 10 to 14 days after the trap. Even after suture removal, you find that you still aren't getting the ideal bleb that you dream about then you would need to go for a slightly more aggressive technique of needling. So basically in a time-based man uh, manner, you need to implement either a massage, play around with the sutures, do a needling before you actually give up, throw your, throw your hands up in the air and initiate anti-glaucoma treatment in the form of topical drugs or even contemplate a repeat trabeculectomy. So this is just a recapitulating what I said. One needs to optimize the ocular surface, pre-treat with steroids if necessary, meticulous surgical technique, wound modulators, and post-op based on the timeline, either do a massage, suture manipulation. One could also, if you see an eminent blood failure, you could start the patient on, uh, start giving the patients subconjunctival 5-FU, but again, now it is not a very popularly uh, adopted uh, method of salvaging the blood. And when all uh, techniques fail, then your last resort would be needling. Uh, studies have said that it makes sense in doing needling at least three to six months after the trap. So until such time, you could try and manipulate and uh, titrate the flow with the techniques that I just mentioned. So this is just a uh, schematic representation of how we would do the massage. At, while the patient is seated at the slit lamp, you ask the patient to look down you could apply pressure through the lid uh, onto the area posterior to the apex of the scleral flap. So this is a flap. You apply pressure posterior there, and you basically induce a fish mouthing of the scleral flap to facilitate aggressive aqueous humor. Or you could apply instant topical anesthesia 
and use a cotton tip applicator or a strabismus hook and apply pressure again posterior to the apex of the scleral flap to induce fish mouthing so this can be done a couple of times but again at the end of massage make sure the anterior chamber has not collapsed and uh, your uh, whether it has actually brought about a reduction in the intraocular pressure laser suture lysis we all know there are different lenses the most popular is a hoskin and zeiss again the timing is important like i said but there are difficulties with laser suture lysis you could you may not be able to visualize a suture if you have an extremely, you have an extremely uh, inflamed and vascular conjunctiva yeah so you could have a perforation because you uh, the suture that you have uh, released can actually cause a perforation in the conjunctiva and leakage and then if the suture not sub protruding you could have irritation so these are certain caveats that you could uh, follow when um, suturing the scleral flap the scleral flap should ideally be 1/3 to 1/2 of the thickness of the sclera you ensure that the sclerostomy is at the center and the suture bite should be long so it should be at least 1/3 from the edge of the scleral flap and you externalize it 2/3 the 2/3 of the length of the suture should be external externalized into the sclera ensure you keep equidistant sutures and it does help in maintaining intraoperative node so you know which suture needs to be manipulated uh, if need be post operatively so this is uh, just a needling i didn't have a video to show you but this is basically a bleb that has failed and um, so for the technique of needling it can be done either in the slit lamp if you're proficient or confident else safer to do it in the operation theater under strict aseptic precautions um needling can be combined with the uh, injection of mitomycin c so one could give uh, 0.3 mg per ml of mitomycin c around 8 to 10 mm posterior to the bleb with the patient looking in down gaze then you give it half an hour after which you take a 29 gauge needle on a tubercle and syringe and you enter the bleb around 2 mm from the edge of the bleb and you move the needle within the conjunctiva in a zigzag manner and release all the adhesions beneath the conjunctiva so technically if you've done a needling well enough you could actually see the bleb rise at the end of the needling as you can see in this image sometimes even releasing the sub uh, conjunctival uh, fibrosis may not suffice so you may need to take the needle subsclerally and release the adhesions there so that becomes a little tricky but then yes it might help you salvage your failing bleb so mitomycin c and half an hour later you could do the needling with a 29 gauge needle needling can be repeated every a month 6 weeks uh, later if you do not find adequate control uh, after one uh, procedure the patient can be advised to do massage after the needling and again you will have to start the patient on topical steroids cyclopegics and antibiotics because you have induced some amount of inflammation as a part of the procedure so again <coughs> just some images this is again a good bleb low lying diffuse avascular bleb this is what we would like we do not want to see a bleb like this lot of congestion cock screwing of vessels these wells uh, these blebs are showing uh, signs of imminent failure and one needs to pitch in and do based on when you're seeing the patient how many days post operatively implement techniques like massage suture removal um or uh, needling this is a thinan cyst where you have an elevated dome shaped uh, encapsulated bleb these are tricky and difficult to manage and more often than not uh, they may need agm after needling procedures have failed this is a problem of uh, mitomycin c where you typically end up with thin cystic blebs and these blebs are notorious because you can have leaks well many many years after the surgery and the patients are at constant risk of developing blebitis and perhaps endophthalmitis so they need to be monitored and followed up for many several years after the initial procedure so again in a nutshell pre op use non tooth forceps one needs to ensure watertight closure of the conjunctiva at the end of glaucoma surgery so um one could use either the teno nylon sutures or ato vicryl whatever one is comfortable with but at the end of the surgery the the the, the conjunctival bleb closure should be watertight if you have in inadvertently had a button hole one needs to address that Uh, before leaving the theater early post op 
recognition and implementing different techniques to salvage the bleb before it is too late. And if all else fails, it ends in needling, bleb revision, or the last resort would be to initiate anti-glaucoma drugs. So yeah, there could be certain things we could try in the OPD to salvage a bleb, but I think um, it is tedious. It requires a lot of uh, uh, attention and uh, manipulation, and it is not as straightforward as a cataract surgery where you're done with the procedure and the patient is taken care of. Unfortunately, in TRAB, I feel half the battle continues into the uh, post-op uh, visits and reviews. I'm done with my talk. If there are any questions or queries, I'm happy to address them. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, Preeti. Uh, I think um, we have all our participants. In I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, Preeti, tell me. Yeah, uh, how soon after surgery do you plan on needling if the blood fails? Uh, okay, studies have said that the needling one, uh, it, it fares better if you can delay it for around four to six months after the initial trap. So we might think, right, earlier we jump in and do the needling, we might have better results. But apparently it has been proven that it makes sense in buying time uh, with massage, suture lysis, or whatever you can, if it's an option, for at least three to six months after the trap. So you I try yeah. two years, apparently. Yeah, there was one study recently which was done on Indian eyes. There haven't been too many studies on Indian eyes. There was one which was done by one of my mentors, Dr. Vanita, and she has done bleb needling successfully for patients up to two years after trap. So, uh, in her study, she included patients from six months to two years after trap. After that, you just have to give up. And you could do it a couple of times, max maybe three times before you give up and then say, okay, you need bleb revision or a repeat trabeculectomy. Thank you. Okay. Should we wrap up if there are no questions? Uh, can I ask um, one more question? Sure. Um, uh, if, you, if a patient has been on long-term prostaglandins before trap, what extra precautions would you take? Like I said, it would not be inappropriate to discontinue the prostaglandin analog a couple of weeks before trap, no harm done. As long as we are sure that this is not going to induce a spike because anyway, the washout would work and stopping the PGA immediately is not going to cause a phenomenal spike in the IOP. So if you see the patient on PGA having an inflamed red, uh, you know, angry looking conjunctival vessels, you could stop the PGA maybe a week, 10 days before the surgery because the PGA would still be working. And if you're okay, you could start the patient on topical steroids, though I have never done it. So yes, they could start stop the PGA for a week, 10 days, and uh, no harm in starting the patient on uh, topical steroid in the meantime. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, ma'am, Dr. Kaushik here. Yeah, hi. I have two doubts. Um, see, one is uh, how frequently do you use adjustable sutures? And uh, I mean, do you do it routinely for every case or you just no. limit it? I, I, have, I have no experience with adjustable sutures. I don't know how to use them. I have only used releasable sutures uh, as far as, yeah, I'm not comfortable with adjustable sutures. So and how I, frequently do you use releasable ones? Releasable, mostly when I know that the trap is not likely to, okay, if it's a pseudophagic glaucoma, I would prefer using a releasable sutures. More often than not, if it's a PACG or a POAG, I'm fine with just putting one apical suture at the end of a triangular flap. And again, like I have actually watched Vijay, Dr. Vijayanand in the OT, he so meticulously titrates that titration is extremely important. So you could put one apex flap on the triangular um, apex suture on the triangular flap and check, inflate your AC with fluid and see if you're getting adequate egress of uh, uh, fluid from the sides of the flap. So if you're, if you're happy with that and then you ensure a watertight closure and then you again inflate your AC and you're getting a reasonably sized bleb, I think you're good to go. But in patients who are pseudophagic glaucomas where you expect you know, a little bit of trouble, it would be safer to apply releasable. But I don't put it for all primary cases. I don't. So, uh, as a follow-up on that, do you use uh, MMC in all primary ideally, cases? Ideally, yes. Ideally, we should. 
in indian eyes i think we should I think Dr. Saurabh has a question. He was asking about uh, if you could just explain once about the massage technique, ma'am. Just okay. Come up and join again. One one technique is you um, you seat the patient at the slit lamp, and through the upper lid with the patient looking in down gaze, through the upper lid you exert pressure in such a way that the point of pressure is posterior to the apex of the flap. So you just imagine the patient sitting there. I'll see if I can take you to that slide. So this is a patient on the slit lamp down gaze. You put pressure with your finger through the lid. Patient's looking down. You put pressure posterior to the apex of the flap. So if the flap ends here, your pressure point should be on the sclera. The minute you do that, you have what's called a fish mouth thing. It's meant to open up if everything is okay with the ostium inside here. So that would cause a slight egress of fluid. The other way is you topically anesthetize the conjunctiva and you could use a cotton tip applicator and put pressure again posterior to the scleral flap that you've created. The other way is also through the lower lid. Um, that again is a little tricky because sometimes when you put pressure, you ask the patient to look up and you put pressure on this lower quadrant of the sclera through the lower lid. That could also facilitate um, the formation of a bleb, but there could be a risk of, you know, you inducing the iris going and blocking the ostium. That can also happen. So, but the safer technique would be doing it through the upper lid. And like I said, if the patient is reasonably um, literate enough to understand, you could even teach the patient to do it. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the for explaining the procedure. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Sanjana, Dr. Nisha here. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the <laughs> thanks for the lovely talk. Uh, yeah, just wanted to know. Uh, you told this um, eye massage. We can also tell the patient they can do at home. Yeah. So for them, usually we advise the upper lid or the lower lid, I which is patients, better. How yeah. often? Yeah, patients can be advised lower lid. That's your safest bet. They could do it a couple right. of times a day, but we okay. need to ensure that we let's say three to four times a day. But we need to definitely follow them up at least once a week when they're doing the massage at home. So right. that there's no inadvertent pressure and collapse of the AC. Okay, and another thing I wanted to ask for this needling, any specific point, entry point for the needling with the 29 gauge needle? Two, they say technically two millimeters from the edge of the blip. Okay. But the MMC would be like almost eight to 10 millimeters posterior to the blip superiorly. Mm -hmm. That okay. is and, so, and since it's just a 29 gauge needle, so we just do the needling and come out. That's it, right? Yeah, we just penetrate the bleb wall and make uh, zigzag movements where we actually, you know, you will actually feel the adhesion snapping when you move the needle subconjunctively. Mm -hmm. So you need to sweep it nicely in the area, the bleb, mm -hmm. the area of bleb, sweep it across nicely. And sometimes if you manage to break the additions, you will actually see the bleb rise that time itself. You'll see, you know, the actors draining out. If you don't, then you need to, you know, be a little braver and take the needle beneath the scleral flap and break all those adhesions uh, subsclerally. And is there any uh, chance of any bleeding happening during yeah, this yeah. procedure? It can, it can. If it does, uh, there could be. It, it won't happen if you're not if you're limiting your uh, needling subconjunctively. But yeah, if you're going subscleral, you could mm -hmm. induce a high femur. You could either because finally it will be a blind procedure, right? If we are yes, uh, yes, subclerally yes. is tricky, and uh, I would I'm still wary of it. So yes, subconjunctival, you will not really run into problems like hyphema too much. Thank you, Doctor Sanjana. Sure. Uh, Ma'am, can I ask one more question? Yes. Um, uh, I just want to know in uh, if you were to compare a trap with MMC to a uh, um, Collagen implant, which would you prefer and why? Trad with MMC all the way because uh, I know uh, it sounds lame, but uh, I think evidence has shown that uh, MMC does better than Ologen. And uh, I would choose Trad and one, uh, Mitomycin. And when you're comfortable with the technique and you know that it works reasonably well, I'm not too inclined to change to something new. So I'm fine with Mitomycin C. Okay, thank you, ma'am. It's not. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Preeti. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for thank your you. patience. Thank, thank you. Thank you, ma'am.